My name is Marcelo Hernandez Castillo, and I am broadcasting from my bedroom in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where it is currently in the around two degrees. This first poem is called Hands, and it's broken up into four parts. Uh, it opens with a par with an epigraph by Era D. Matthews. It goes, Dear God, if we were made to be ghosts, why do the bullets still work? One, dear God, I have seen the door of a black child's face open to let the sidewalk in as a cop stands over his body. I'm not going to pretend that your eyes are anything like ours or that your statue is of the visible. What counts as the visible when measured by a gun? You are nothing like us. If you were, there would be no need for prayer. There isn't enough room in a body for a bullet, or the street with its weeks of rain, or the cop's arm trying to push the bullet further, a tired song in the first parade. How deep the well that you can't see the stones at the bottom. In your place there is a song and a window, the boy lying on the street is trying to get up, but you won't let him. He is looking for the door, but hasn't found it yet. Two, to my 14-year-old nephew. In a few years, everything you touch will resemble a gun. You will be one more Midas of black objects. The guard will think that it's possible for a gun to grow out of your hand like a bouquet of flowers bursting from your nails. I'm here to tell you not to run in public, to keep your hands out of your pockets in stores, and never reach into your backpack. Keep your money at hand, your hands away from your body. Hold the only part of you that resembles a forest, Measure how far you can reach and cut it in half. Otherwise, someone else might cut it for you. See everything in halves. The dirt half. The light half of a hundred. Count Mississippis before speaking to the cop. One Mississippi. Two Mississippi. Three Mississippi. Hold your hands like this. This isn't a game, though you're only 14, and most things are games. You are forever 18, and large, and at the end of a gun. Say, yes, sir, and no, sir. I was just on my way to school, sir. That's just a pen, sir. That's just my hand, sir. That's just a pen. That's only a pen, sir. How can I make you understand? that you are 14 and not 14 before you have to figure it out for yourself. Three. Yes, yes, no, long enough to know, enough, maybe, but we both know I do. After Kenshin. Are you afraid of me? There's a name for that. It's posted on your door, though you seem to ignore it. Do you think I am incapable of pain? It hurts to hear the sun make its way through the same body, retrieving the hands that hold it afloat. How else do you think we can be both hollow and solid at once? Am I a small dancing figure with the sign of the cross blessing the wounded? How long have you been looking at me? Then you can see my hands the way they hold my body together. If you can see, then surely the bodies are piling on top of me. How long is enough? Is your house enough? Is your wife and kids enough? Is your car enough? Is the way you say, show me your hands enough? And then I show you my hands, and then you show me yours. Is that what you saw? There's a big show behind the curtains of my palms. I don't want an applause or an audience of you with your badge. I want you to be silent, turn the other way. 
I want to pretend that just once I can point to you and you won't come. That I can raise my hands and praise the sidewalk that's dry and empty. Absent of bodies like mine folded on the floor. I want to pretend that I can't hear your applause when you pull the trigger. Four translations. Dear slain child, I can hear your hum sweet, a line through. What do you do? Cup breath, a single word song. How long, a long please. Line through the young, pass to the young. Heavy, doesn't want to say. Can you hear, father, feather, best? Can you be sewn back together? Or that it doesn't want to be along, please? Everything was so heavy. Everything was at once. Then the blind hum, the cup breath. What do you do with black and brown hands? Hear your own, policeman's radio. Listen, line static in the shape of hands, and the child, who will hum for him, like the knot, like a door held open. This poem is titled Elegy. If it isn't the rain, it must be the hollow wood that echoes when I touch it. How else do the birds know when to abandon their nests humming with lice? They're only masks because we make them beautiful. Otherwise, it would be too bright and no one would be afraid to die. But where do the sick hide when the cloths are taken out and cut into robes more numinous than rain? I know because I don't. Every child must grow from a center because even the light needs something to rest on, as does the cold disguised as a mother's hands. And either praise the beautiful or praise what is left over, incapable of pain. I will soak, I will choose the one that is most like a bridge and soak my hands in it. So what is it like here um, where I'm at? It's very different. Um, at first, I didn't know what to do. I had never been in a town like this. I had never left California. Um, and I left California on an airplane uh, when DACA t still didn't exist. Um, I had no proper ID. I had to fly here uh, with the fear of being questioned for not having a visa on my passport um, because of my documentation status. Um, it took about seven months of planning to just get here to begin with. And when I got here, I found out that there was very, very little raza here, that my gente just wasn't here. And when they were, and if they were, um, they were excluded from the enclave that the university built around itself. It was very difficult for me. And um, it, still, it still is. I just arrived from California a few days ago um, from winter break and uh, coming back, I'm suddenly realizing that walking out, there's very little people who look like me who I can share a conversation with, who um, who, I, who I can relate to. Um, and it's very uh, isolating. Uh, so, is, do I feel safe here or where do I feel nervous or unsafe? Um, I feel nervous a lot of the times. Um, coming here was the first time that I've really had a lot of um, anxiety attacks because of my nervousness. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, uh, I guess for the first time I saw, I guess, my differentness, my otherness. I saw, I saw, I, I, I I experienced being othered in a way that I had never before experienced. And so I felt unsafe, like at gatherings, at readings. Um, I would just look around me and there's literally nobody like me. Uh, and I have other writers of color who I congregate around. And I feel safe with them. I feel safe when I'm with my friends who I can feel comfortable talking with about um, racism, or talking about race issues, gender issues. Um, so I feel nervous a lot of the times in front of, in a classroom when I had to teach 
my students, um, which was in a class that was 100% white, um, having to talk to them about um, privilege, having to talk to them about privilege on all levels, gender, race, ability, etc. Um, it was really scary to be in that kind of position. Uh, there's a lot of scenarios like going to readings, uh, reading myself um, at parties or at, um, faculty events, at um, school-sponsored events, is when I feel really nervous because I, I feel like um, that's when I feel most different, that um, I don't come from the same places that a lot of these people come from. Um, and there's a lot of things that I had to worry about as an undocumented student for the first two years uh, that a lot of people didn't have to worry about. Um, so the police always made me unsafe. Um, uh, I don't know the police here, and I, I didn't, not to say that I knew the police back in California, but um, being raised there, I, I knew what to do and what not to do, and here I was really afraid of that. Um, so what have I been thinking about lately? I've been thinking about many things. I've been very angry. This past year has been a very um, stressful and very hectic year. I've been thinking about what it means to be a person of color in this country in 2014, 2015, and how little our lives matter to so many people. How little people think that immigration affects families how little police officers value the lives of black and brown bodies. I mean, when I heard of the Darren Wilson failure to indict news, I, was, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised the way it was going, the way their justifications were. It doesn't surprise me how little people care and it doesn't surprise me that people still think that racism means seeing people in white hoods, that racism means not being able to enter a specific restaurant or, or not being able to get a, a, a house or something like that. No, um, the face of racism has changed and continues to change every year. Compared to, compared to the kinds of discrimination that my parents went through in the 70s, coming here to work, not knowing any English, not having any money, not having anything with them but the clothes on their backs when they crossed the border, um, and always in fear for their lives on the border and always in fear for their safety um, here, um, there's, that, that still exists. That still exists. I might see it in a different form that they saw it, but nonetheless, it has the same consequences. I'm always reminded of an essay by Rob Nixon called Slow Violence, that we're so accustomed to the spectacular kinds of violence and only validate that kind of violence. Any other kinds of violence we dismiss um, and don't consider it as violence, and if we don't consider it as violence, then we don't need to do, we feel like we don't need to do anything about it. Um, but it's these slower forms of violence that accrue over generations and generations and that are embedded in our public vocabulary and that are embedded in our public consciousness um, that manifest themselves uh, each and every day. Um,